Hey there folks, Tim Slade here from the eLearning Designers Academy and community. Thank you so much for watching this how-to workshop where we're gonna be taking a deep look at how to write an eLearning storyboard. Now, if you've never watched any of my how-to workshops, these are meant to be sessions where we take a deep dive into all things eLearning, instructional design, development, articulate storyline, visual design, and everything else in between, all right? Now, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, make sure to click that like, subscribe, and that bell button so that you'll get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And of course, make sure to join us inside the eLearning Designers community where you can connect, network, and learn from others in our industry who are looking to grow their eLearning design and development skills and careers. All right, so how do you write an eLearning storyboard? You know, let me start off with a story here. I've talked about this before. My very, very first e-learning project was actually five e-learning projects in one big project where I was required to build an e-learning course on the five steps for how to catch shoplifters. Now, at the time, I'd never created an e-learning course before. And I remember sitting at my computer, just staring at my screen going, my gosh, how do I move from having a bunch of raw content to creating a fully developed e-learning course for my learners. And this is actually a common roadblock that a lot of people run into in our industry where when you imagine a completed e-learning course, right? It has all these amazing graphics. It might have audio narration and animations and interactivity and all of this stuff and all this really great content, right? And it can seem like such a huge leap to go from a bunch of raw content uh, that's disorganized and all over the place to a completed, fully developed e-learning course, right? And the mistake a lot of people make is that they try to make that leap. They try to just go from raw content to creating the fully completed course. But that doesn't that's rarely ever successful, not only because it's just too big of a leap, but also it, it, it fails to take into account all of the little things, all the little steps that go into designing a really good e-learning course, like having your stakeholders and subject matter experts involved in the process. So what should you do instead? Well, that's why in our industry, we um, work towards building a completed e-learning course in different steps iterations along the way. One of those things happens to be a storyboard and then also a prototype. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two later. But I wanna focus in today on writing a storyboard. Now, if you've ever attempted to write a storyboard before, or maybe you have written a storyboard before, you know that how overwhelming it can be. I mean, this is usually the first major roadblock that a lot of folks run into when they develop their first e-learning course because even writing an e-learning uh, storyboard uh, is, is a huge task because there's so much that goes into creating your storyboard. And so what I want to do today is walk you through my process for how to create a storyboard and the different types of storyboards. We'll take a look at all of that. But before we do that, I want to mention one quick thing. I'm showing you my process for writing a storyboard. And one of the things I want you to acknowledge and understand is that if you go out on the internet and you Google how to write a storyboard, or you go ask somebody online how to write a storyboard, more often than not, like nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, honestly, you're going to hear 10 different answers <laughs> from 10 different people. There is no singular right way to create a storyboard. And there's no singular format you should use. And so as I walk you through my process, you might discover that you have a totally different process or you might hear other people have different processes for writing their storyboard. What I want you to do is take what you can from my process to create your own process, right? And that might mean mimicking my process from beginning to end or creating your own process along the way. So let's start with this question though, because I do want to make sure we're all speaking the same language as we talk about storyboards. What is an e-learning storyboard in the first place? Now this is an important thing to understand because just like I said a moment ago, if you ask 10 different people what their process is for writing a storyboard, you're gonna get 10 different answers. But if you ask 10 different people what a storyboard is, you're gonna also find you're gonna get 10 very different answers. You know, if we look at uh, what in my mind's eye a storyboard was before I fell into this industry, it looks something like this, what you see here on the screen. Now, traditionally, storyboards are used within the film industry where people make movies or TV shows 
to uh, plan out all of the different shots that they need to film when they're creating a movie or a TV series or any sort of video. What doesn't happen is that a movie director doesn't just go, hey, let's make a movie. Let me get some actors, I'm gonna get a camera, and you know, they start filming, right? It, it's not all random like that. It's actually a very planned out, executed process. And after you know somebody's written a script, one of the things that they do is they go line by line in that script. And then they start creating these little storyboards to plan out every single shot that they're going to uh, shoot and film to make that movie, right? The reason that they do that is because they need to know what are we gonna film before we film it. Well, the truth is, an e-learning storyboard isn't all that different from something like this. Now, in the world of movies and TV, the script and the storyboard are the storyboard are two separate things. But in the world of e-learning, because we're creating interactive courses, we combine those things to create an e-learning storyboard. One of the ways I like to, uh, one of the analogies I like to use when I'm describing what a storyboard is, is I like to refer to it as being like a blueprint for a house. Just like a director doesn't just get a camera and some actors to create a movie randomly, the same thing doesn't happen with building a house, right? You don't just go, hey, I want to build a house. Let me run down to the local hardware store, grab some wood and a nail gun, and we're going to start building a house, right? No, it doesn't happen that way, right? You have to work with an architect, and the architect draws out a blueprint, and then it hands it off to a construction team so that they know what they're going to build before they build it. And if you're gonna be the prospective homeowner, you wanna know it's gonna be built before it's built, right? You don't want just people randomly building a house based off of you know, wanting three bedrooms, two baths. Well, how is it gonna be laid out? How's it gonna look? Is it gonna be modern or craftsman style? Those are questions that have to be answered before you start building, right? And that's what a blueprint does. The same is true for an e-learning course. It allows you to plan out what you're gonna build before you build it so that A, you know what you're gonna build and B, Whoever you're working for or working with, your stakeholders, your subject matter experts, your clients, they know what you're gonna build before you build it. Now, this is typically what a storyboard looks like. In my definition of a storyboard, a storyboard is a document that outlines my course content, all of the course content, slide by slide, by slide or screen by screen. If it includes audio narration, that's in the storyboard. If it includes on-screen text or graphics or animations, that's documented in the storyboard. If there's gonna be some interactivity where the learner clicks a button and it reveals some content or it jumps to a screen, that's detailed in the storyboard. And it's gonna be detailed what the button says and where it's gonna take the learner, right? It literally documents everything that's included in the course. Now, <clears throat> the reason why storyboarding is such a challenge for people is if you're not accustomed to documenting at that level of detail, it can seem so overwhelming. I mean, imagine if, you know, if you're a, a classroom facilitator, for example, right? Yeah, you might have a facilitator guide where it lists, you know, bullet point by bullet point the content you're going to cover. But you don't literally script out every single word that's going to be said or that you're going to say to your audience or to your learners, right? It doesn't script out every single word that might be on your screen or on your slides. In that moment, you kind of wing it using the guidance from your facilitator guide, right? Well, that's not true with e-learning. You need to plan out everything you're going to build before you build it because A, you need to review it with your stakeholders and subject matter experts, and B, not only do you need to know what you're gonna build, but you might be handing off the storyboard for somebody else to build it. We'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so now that we have a common understanding of what an e-learning storyboard is, let's answer this question. Why should you write an e-learning storyboard in the first place? Now, I kind of alluded to some of the reasons here a moment ago, but I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you three specific reasons and, and go into a little bit more detail about them. So the first reason you wanna write a storyboard is that it's easier with a storyboard to focus solely on your content. When you're creating an e-learning course, uh, it's a piece of mixed multimedia, right? You have animations and you have audio narration, you might have video, you might have graphics and images, and of course buttons and branching and all sorts of stuff happening in a course. Well, you know, at the end of the day though, <laughs> you might have all this really great stuff that creates an engaging e-learning course. All of that's kind of meaningless if the content isn't accurate and isn't properly designed and isn't focused on performance, right? And so starting with a storyboard allows you to really make sure and validate that your content is accurate and it's covering the right information. Now, the other reason you might want to start with a storyboard or the other reason I recommend that you start with a storyboard is that it makes it easier to collaborate with your stakeholders and your subject matter experts. When you're designing and developing an e-learning course, you wanna give them an opportunity to review and edit the content of your course, right? And so when you start with a storyboard, uh, it's something that you can send off, that they can edit, hopefully by tracking changes, 
add comments to. It's something you can iterate on. And also, it can help them focus on the content. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the different types of storyboards. And then as I just mentioned a moment ago, creating a storyboard makes it easier to iterate on. Trust me, it's much easier to change the words in the storyboard than to change the details, the words, the graphics, the animations, the audio narration, the interactivity in a completed e-learning course. I mean, the truth is even the smallest change in a fully developed completed e-learning course can require hours of work depending on what's being changed. Now let's go back to the example of like uh, a blueprint for a house, right? Part of the reason an architect starts with a blueprint is if the prospective homeowner says, hey, you know what, can we add an extra bedroom? Or, you know what, I got the kitchen's over there, can we move it over here? Well, you don't wanna find those things out once you've started building the house because moving the kitchen or adding an extra bedroom might actually mean rebuilding the house, right? And so we start with a blueprint so everyone can see how the house is gonna be laid out. And if you do decide you wanna move the kitchen or the homeowner decides they wanna move the kitchen and add an extra bedroom, it's just a matter of erasing some walls and some lines and redrawing it, right? The same concept applies with e-learning. The reason you start with a storyboard is so that when your stakeholder or reviewer comes to you and says, hey, can we change the flow of those scenarios? Or can we add an extra uh, section about this new topic I didn't tell you about at the start of the project, right? You don't have to start redeveloping that course. You can start doing it in your storyboard. It's easy to edit those words in the storyboard before you move into development so that everyone's on the same page about what you're gonna build before you build it. It can save you time and money. Now, there are instances where, you know, even when you do a really good storyboard, stakeholders and subject matter experts are gonna come back and change all those things, right? Nothing's 100% set in stone, but we'll talk about managing scope creep a little bit later. All right, so now let's get to the, <laughs> the, the meat of it all. How do you actually write an e-learning storyboard, all right? There's uh, a lot of different strategies you can write, you can use to write your e-learning storyboard. For me, I've come down to a process that works for me most of the time. And I'm gonna show you a lot of different examples of storyboards from my own real projects. And what I want you to notice is that every one, every one of those storyboards I'm gonna show you is gonna look a little bit different, right? And the process I follow is slightly different. And that's important for you to understand if you're new to e-learning, it's okay to adapt the process, the templates you use, whatever you're doing, to fit the project you're working on. That's why there's no single right way to go about doing this. But hopefully the five steps I'm gonna walk you through will help make it a little bit easier. All right, so the first step for how to write an e-learning storyboard, collect and organize your content. Now, I'm gonna make a quick public service announcement here, asterisk. Um, there's a lot that goes into the instructional design process when you're creating e-learning or anything for that matter, right? You need to start off with a needs analysis, validate why there's a performance issue. You're gonna design a, a learning intervention that might be blended. It may or may not include e-learning. You might create a design document or do an action map, right? There's a lot that goes into the instructional design process before you even start writing a storyboard. What I'm talking about today is specifically how to write a storyboard, right? So it kind of assumes that you've done all of that other instructional design stuff before you've gotten to this point, all right? So if you're wondering why, Tim, like, why are you starting at talking about this with a storyboard? Well, it, again, like I said, I'm assuming that you've already done all of that other important stuff with the instructional design process. And I'll include some links down in the description where you can learn more about some of that other stuff. We're just talking about storyboards today, all right? So step one, organize and collect your content. And we're gonna talk by uh, talking about strategies for collecting your content. Here's what doesn't happen in reality. And this is a common mistake I think a lot of new e-learning designers, new instructional designers make when they're tackling their very first learning projects. A lot of times we go into projects and we get assigned a stakeholder or a subject matter expert, and we just assume they're going to, you know, hand us this nice clean stack of information and they're gonna be like, hey, Here's your content. You go, oh, great, thank you. I just gotta you know, convert this into e-learning. Well, that doesn't really happen in real life. A lot of the information that you need to create your e-learning course is in their heads. It might be in a bunch of messy PowerPoint documents. It may not even exist and you have to create it from scratch. And so part of collecting your course content might mean you as an instructional designer might need to create it because your stakeholders aren't just gonna go, hey, Here's all the content. You just gotta convert it into e-learning, right? And even if they do hand you a stack of PowerPoints to convert into e-learning, more often than not, those PowerPoints are gonna be full of bullet points and gonna be awful, and you're not gonna just convert it into e-learning, you're gonna extract from it, right? 
So let's talk about a couple different options for how you go about collecting or creating your content. In my opinion, there's one of two paths you can go down, or it might be a combination of the two. The first option might be curating content, right? You curate existing content to convert it into your e-learning course, or the second option is to create your content from scratch. And there's probably a little bit of overlap between these two on any project that you're working on. Now, when we talk about curating your content, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing that. You might review existing training content. There might be a course that was you know, taught in person. Now you're making it into an e-learning course. You might extract from that, or it might be a series of job aids that you're converting into an e-learning or video. You can extract from that. Uh, it might be reviewing documented best practices, right? Maybe there's a best practice that exists that has really clear documentation, but now you're creating more formalized training. You might extract from that. It might be collecting existing SME materials. Like I said, they might have some PowerPoints or documents that they've used in the past. They'll hand it to you. You might extract from that. You don't want to just convert that into training, but you might extract from it to create training, right? And you might also Google it. I wish more people in our industry admitted the fact that sometimes we just Google topics to figure out, you know, uh, different ways that we can teach something or get content for something, right? So it's curating your content. You can also create your content from scratch, right? That might mean, uh, or it might involve conducting a task analysis where you analyze a specific procedure or task or behavior, and you break it down into individual tasks and subtasks to understand the process of something that you need to teach, right? You might also create an action map. Action mapping is a, a backwards design process where you start with a business goal that you're looking to achieve, and then you figure out what actions or behaviors learners need to take to achieve that goal. And then you figure out what kind of practice activities you can create to put those actions, behaviors into practice. And then you figure out what information you might need to include in order to uh, help learners achieve that, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about outlines a little bit later. I don't wanna conflate the two. An outline and action map are two very different things. An action map is a, a way to analyze how to go about achieving a business goal. An outline is something totally different. We'll talk a little bit about that. It might involve observing or interviewing your learners, right? If you're creating a course on something, you might go observe and interview those learners who are doing it the right way and extract from them how did they learn to do that or observing them and creating your content based off of those observations. Um, or interviewing your SMEs. One of the things that I've done many times before is I'll interview my SMEs or sometimes I'll just record them or I'll let them record themselves showing me what needs to be done or how it needs to be done. And then I can use that to create my content for the course. And then of course, Googling it is another way you can create your content. See what's out there and then uh, adapt it to fit your needs, right? All right. Now, once you've collected all this content, you have all this content that you've collected, you've curated, you might've created it, right? You have a bunch of stuff. At this point, you're still probably gonna be really overwhelmed because you don't know what is nice to know information versus must know information. You don't know how this is going to structure itself into some sort of cohesive e-learning course that's interactive and makes sense. Well, the first thing I recommend that you do is create an outline. Start by organizing your content into an outline. Now, I'm gonna show you a bunch of different examples, but let me walk through the process of how do you create your outline. For me, I usually like to start my outlines by using a bunch of sticky notes and a marker. And creating an outline is a process where you kind of just process all of the information, all the raw content you have, in order to create a structure for how you're going to teach that content instructionally. So as you process all of the information you've curated, you've collected, or you've created, what I usually like to do is I like to take some sticky notes and a whiteboard and I start writing down all of my main topics, right? So I know I'm gonna have a main topic for this, that, or the other thing, and they each get a sticky note. Now there's no structure here, it's just me getting everything on a sticky note up on a board, right? And then from there, as you continue processing the information, you might start adding subtopics, right? So you realize, oh, okay, there's these topics that live under these main topics. You might discover that some topics need to be combined or separated out. You might discover that some of it's nice to know information that you don't need. You get rid of that, right? You start organizing this and affinitizing it in some sort of meaningful way. And once you've done that, then you start going, yeah, you know what, maybe I do need to have an introduction. I'm gonna have a slide for some learning objectives. I'm gonna have a conclusion and quiz at the end of all of this. So you start creating sticky notes for those different elements. 
And then once you've got that documented, then maybe you start drawing arrows between these sticky notes. And before you know it, each of these sticky notes almost start representing an individual slide within your e-learning course, right? And you start seeing how the content might flow from one topic to another or one slide or one screen from one to the other. And then you might discover, you know what, maybe I want it to have a main menu and I want it to branch to different areas. So you reorganize all your sticky notes, you redraw your arrows to show a main menu and how it's gonna branch to different areas. And then you start adding other sticky notes because maybe after main topic one, you wanna have a system simulation. And then you know after topic three, maybe you're gonna do some sort of learning scenario and then you're gonna have a conclusion and quiz after all of that. And you start organizing it in some sort of meaningful way. Once you've done this, you kind of have a skeleton, a, a map that you can start using to start storyboarding your e-learning course. It's a springboard to help you process all the information. It doesn't include details about actually what's going to be covered on each individual slide or what the learning scenarios might be, but it's enough to get you started with your storyboard and processing all the information that you have. And you might discover that you need to break this out into two courses or uh, maybe not all of it needs to be in the e-learning course. It's this iterative, messy process of processing all of that information. So let's take a look at some examples. I'll show you a couple of different examples of real life outlines that I've done. This first example I'm gonna show you, one of the tools that I like to use when I'm creating my outlines is a tool uh, called Miro.com, M-I-R-O. And it's a free tool, you can check it out. It's great for mind maps, and there's all sorts of other templates out there that you can use for it. Um, and usually after I've created my outline with a bunch of sticky notes on a whiteboard, I'll usually then bring it into a tool like this to start organizing it in a more clean, efficient way, right? And so as we look at this outline, this was for a real client project that I worked on on diversity and inclusion. I'll show you some additional examples uh, of this actual course as it was storyboarded and developed. But as you can see here, so we have our title screen. That's going to be the title slide of the course. We have our introduction, and then we get to a main menu. And then in this particular course, there was four different branches, right? So we have a branch for what is diversity and inclusion. We have a branch for what is unconscious bias and a branch for what is respect in the workplace. And then finally, that summary and conclusion. And if we go down one of these branches, you can see, so we have what is diversity and inclusion, moves on to a slide or a screen about what is discrimination or a section, uh, discrimination according to the law, and that's going to include some different um, interactions. So we have a interaction where the learner has to read some different examples and determine is it actually an example of discrimination maybe there's some scenarios on diversity and inclusion and then it finishes off with a what should you do with some additional scenarios and once they've completed this this section then they go all the way back to the main menu and they continue on down the other paths now ideally each of these little squares represents an individual slide within my finished course and if you're familiar with say Articulate Storyline, maybe that's the tool you're using, it almost looks like Story View or Scene View, where you see that high level map of your course, right? That's essentially what you're creating. You're creating the course flow, the map, that then you can use to start storyboarding. Now the goal when you create your outline is to have enough detail in the outline to act as a guide, a map, that skeleton, that mainframe of structure to help you start storyboarding, right? And so what I think the, the, the big issue I see people do too frequently is they, they say way too high level with their outline. They, they listen topics, but it doesn't really outline slide by slide what's going to be covered or how it's going to flow. So you wanna have enough detail that it can actually help you start storyboarding it, right? And some outlines have more information than others. Some outlines, for example, if you're doing some branching scenarios, you might actually outline you know, each branch. Uh, it's whatever level of detail that you actually need. Now I should mention too, as, I, as we look at this, this type of outline, I don't show to my stakeholders or subject matter experts or my client. This is for me. This is for me to help me, you know, uh, storyboard my course. But in this particular project, this was for a, a client that when I was working as a freelancer, for this particular project, I did want to provide a high level outline that outlined a little bit more detail than this about all of these topics that I'm talking about and what I was gonna cover for each topic. So one thing you might do that I've done in the past is create a written outline. So what I did is I took this outline and I created this linear written outline in a format that I could send to my stakeholders, my subject matter expert, my client, for them to review, comment on, and edit. And it's all the same information 
but it's presented in a way that's editable and it includes some additional information. Now this outline you can see includes some information like the course title, obviously. It also includes information about the learning objectives. You'll see this as a common thread in some of the other storyboards that I'll show you. I always like to include the learning objectives because it kind of acts as that North Star to keep you on track with what the course is supposed to cover and what it doesn't cover, right? And instead of showing this as a visual outline, what I did is I created it as a series of tables. Think of it as like a really watered down, bare bones storyboard, right? So we can see here, I'll zoom in here, uh, we have you know, a column for our slide titles, a column for our topics, and then a column for the description. And so if we look here, like the course opening, I'll just go back and forth between this and uh, our outline. Here's our course opening. We have the title slide, the introduction, the main menu. If we go back here, same thing, title slide, introduction, main menu. What topics are being covered? Well, the title slide doesn't have any topics because it's just a title slide, so NA. Introduction, we're gonna talk about the purpose of the course, the learning objectives. Main menu, again, not gonna have any topics because it's just a main menu. And then we look at a description. So title slide with a start button, uh, description for our introduction. This is a text-based slide, provides a high-level introduction to the topics being covered, uh, their importance to this organization along with the learning objectives. And then our main menu. This menu would offer three different branches. The learner would explore in order, followed by a conclusion option, which would unlock after all three sections have been viewed. Section one, section two, section three. What is diversity inclusion? What is unconscious bias? What is respect in the workplace, right? All of these elements are exactly what you see here in this outline. But doing it in this format is something that allows me, again, like I said, send this off to my stakeholders, subject matter experts, in a way that they can understand. And so forth and so on. So you can see all of this. We have a lot of text-based slides. Here we have an activity, is it discrimination? This activity would present the learner with a series of very short scenarios. The learner would need to identify which ones are examples of discrimination. The reason I did it like this is not only because it allows them to review and edit it, on, edit it but it also makes sure I'm including the right information in the order in which they wanted to see it um, presented, which is, which is nice because it saves me time in the storyboard stage where I don't have to do a lot of re-storyboarding if I didn't capture it all. So this was another, another iterative step working towards my storyboard. It's something you might consider doing for your own projects, all right? Um, so those are outlines, and you can use all sorts of different tools for creating your outlines. I see people use tools like Miro or Jamboard, which is a Google tool. Um, Mural is another one. Uh, and sometimes you can create your outlines just in PowerPoint using basic shapes. What's important is it's whatever makes it easiest for you. And if that's just sticky notes and uh, uh, a black marker, then so be it, right? Okay, creating outline, great first step. So we talked about step one, organize your content, collect it, figure out if you need to curate some content, maybe you need to create some content from scratch because it's not gonna just be handed to you, and then start processing that information, organize it into some sort of outline. Now our next step is to pick a format, pick a storyboard format for your courses. Now, uh, like I said at the top of uh, this how-to workshop, I mentioned that there's no single process for creating storyboards and there's definitely no single format or template for creating storyboards. You go Google e-learning storyboard template, you're gonna get hundreds if not thousands of different templates out there. And I'll provide a link down in the description for where you can uh, download my templates or versions of my templates, but what I encourage you to do is take them and adapt them to fit your needs, fit your projects, right? There's a lot of different types of storyboards. Now, when we talk about storyboards, I would be remiss if we didn't also talk a little bit about prototypes, because I think a lot of times people conflate storyboards with prototypes and confuse storyboards with prototypes or uh, think they're two very distinct separate things. And some people do define them that way. I personally, I view storyboards and prototypes as a spectrum of many different things <laughs> with different levels of complexity and levels of fidelity, right? So. When you're creating an e-learning course, like I said, when you're moving from raw content to a completed e-learning course, you wanna move from something that has a low level of detail, low level of fidelity, and work towards something that is more high detailed, a higher level of fidelity as you work towards that completed course, right? So as we look at this spectrum, right? A storyboard outlines all of the content. You might start with an outline. We see that there on the far left. Then you might move to a written storyboard or a visual storyboard which a written storyboard's just text, doesn't have a lot of detail about the visuals or the slide layout. And then a visual storyboard has a higher level of fidelity where you are seeing the layout of the different slides, different elements. I'll show you an example of that. 
And then as we move into prototypes, prototypes are usually created in the actual authoring tool that you're using. So a wireframe prototype, for example, uh, might uh, have some clickable elements, but it's not gonna have a lot of uh, you know, graphics. It's not gonna have your fonts, your colors, logos, or final images. It might just be simple uh, elements that the you can click on to validate functionality. Then we get into a visual prototype. That's when you start integrating you know, actual images or graphics or animations or fonts or colors into the design of your course. And then an MVP prototype on the far right there with the highest level of fidelity. That's usually a completed, fully developed sample of your course. And you move through these different phases as you create your course and make something that's more detailed and more complete at each step of the way. You don't just leap from raw content to a completed e-learning course. Now, creating prototypes, separate topic for a separate how-to workshop. For right now, we're just going to focus in on our storyboards, right? So I talked about a course outline. Let's now talk about written versus visual storyboards. These are the two primary types of storyboards, and you'll see different variations of these or formats of these if you go out and Google, uh, but they usually are categorized into these two buckets. So let's start by looking at a written storyboard. A written storyboard, like I showed you earlier, is just a written document that outlines each slide or screen slide by slide, word for word, including all the audio narration, the graphics, some technical notes, uh, and all the other uh, you know, elements you might include in your e-learning course. And it would be my opinion that written storyboards are ideal when you want to focus just on the content. You don't want to focus on the visuals. Uh, they're ideal when you're designing a course with audio narration because uh, you can script out that audio narration slide by slide or screen by screen. And I also think written storyboards are ideal when you're creating video based courses because again, it's more focused on audio narration versus the actual visuals. And I'll show you an example storyboard that I've done for, for video based courses. Now, on the other hand, visual storyboards are like written storyboards, but they include the additional element of these simple little mock-ups of the screen, right? You might mock up exactly what the screen might look like, how it's laid out, uh, using placeholder images, graphics, text, uh, simple buttons to lay it out. Now, in my opinion, visual storyboards are ideal when you wanna focus on slide layout or when you're designing text-based courses. When you're designing a text-based course, it's super, super critical and when I say text-based course, by the way, I mean a course that's just on-screen text. There's no audio narration or animations, right? A text-based course, I think it's super critical that you're very thoughtful about how much content you're putting on each screen or each slide. And as you'll see in a moment when I jump into the examples, you'll see uh, an example of a text-based course where it, it has all the text on the screen and you have to be thoughtful uh, about that. Now, I'm going to go back here to um, our two storyboards here, the, the written versus the visual storyboard. I mentioned that a written storyboard is really ideal when you want to focus uh, on the content, and it's also really ideal when you want to focus your stakeholders and subject matter experts on the content. Because here's what happens, and, and, and this will happen to you at some point in the process. Let's say you go with a visual storyboard, right? You send a stakeholder, subject matter expert, a storyboard that looks like uh, this one here, right, with the little mock-ups. Inevitably, no matter how much you tell them, hey, those are mock-ups, it doesn't represent the actual look and feel of the course, inevitably, you're going to get a note or a comment or an email where they're going to say, hey, you know what, is that really what the course is going to look like? Like, is it going to include these little blue simple characters and is the whole course going to be blue with blue buttons? Is that really what the course is going to look like, right? And no matter how much you tell them, no, it's not. It's a mock-up. They'll still think it's the completed version of the course. And when you're at the storyboard stage, you really don't want your stakeholder subject matter experts focused on the layout or whether you're including a character or a placeholder image. It's really irrelevant at that stage. What you really need them for, because they're subject matter experts, is to focus on your content. Is it accurate? Does it include the right information? Is there missing information? Is it being presented according to your level of expertise, right? That's what you want them focusing in on. And so sometimes in those instances, a written storyboard makes more sense because it's just focused in on the content and they're not getting distracted with colors and whether or not you're using placeholder images or those ugly square characters because they don't understand what a mock-up is, right? Uh, visual storyboards, on the other hand, these types of storyboards, if I go back to my visual storyboard, 
in my opinion, those are ideal when you're working with stakeholders, subject matter experts who are more familiar with e-learning design and development. All right. So that's my thoughts on the difference between visual storyboards and uh, written storyboards. Now, before I jump into some examples, one of the other things you have to consider when you are thinking about a visual storyboard or an, a written storyboard, and I talked a little bit about audio-based courses versus text-based courses or courses that include audio narration versus just being on screen text, is you have to really think about during this early stage of development, writing your storyboard, is determining how you actually want to present your course content. And there's some questions you need to ask yourself. So. Like I said a moment ago, are you creating a text-based course or are you creating an audio-based course, right? Can your learners, if you include audio, will they be able to hear it? Will their computer support audio? Uh, and if you are doing audio, do you have learners who have hearing impairments? Maybe you need to include closed captioning. What e-learning authoring tool or tools are you using, right? Not all e-learning authoring tools support the same type of course experience. If you're creating a course that's just text that they're gonna be taking it on their mobile device all day, Maybe a course in RISE makes more sense than a course in Storyline because RISE is a text-based e-learning authoring tool that's focused on uh, mobile responsiveness, right? Even though you can include video and some audio, it's mainly text, right? Whereas if you're developing in a tool like Storyline where you can and create, you can create more you know, immersive multimedia experiences with audio and animations and interactivity, uh, maybe that's the type of course you're going to create and that might influence what type of storyboards you use. Will there be any interactivity, right? So uh, what type of interactivity are you wanting to create and how does that support the learning experience? And how does that relate to which e-learning authoring tool you're using? Storyline, you can create anything you can imagine. Whereas Rise, it's more focused on click to reveal interactions with some scenarios, right? And then what's best for uh, achieving your desired learning outcomes? So uh, picking, figuring out how you're gonna present your learning content, how are you gonna do it in a way that's gonna be most effective for that content? If you're creating something that is uh, best learned with a visual explanation, with some audio ex explanation, maybe then you're going to create a audio-based course and a tool like Storyline with a series of animations. Or maybe you're creating a video a uh, total 100% uh, video-based course, right? That you're gonna put uh, develop in Camtasia. Maybe a written storyboard makes sense. Or if you're creating a text-based course, you know, maybe you're, you're gonna use a visual storyboard. You know, it all depends, right? You have to figure out how you're gonna present your content in a way that's gonna be the most effective for your learners, for the learning goals, for the business, all of that stuff, all right? So let's take a look at some storyboard examples, some different ones, and then I'll also show you the completed versions of those course so you can compare how it moved from an outline to a storyboard to the actual developed course here, all right? So this first one I wanna show you, this one is a very stereotypical, traditional uh, written storyboard. And this was for uh, a client on the topic of a course on an introduction to accounting. And, uh, and it was a course that included audio narration. So I'm gonna uh, walk you through the storyboard the first couple slides and I'll actually show you the completed fully developed version. Like I said a little bit ago, um, I usually include the learning objectives somewhere in my storyboard because it's a good indicator or reminder for me on what our course is focused on so I don't get out of scope and start including extra information. But it's also good to remind your stakeholders and subject matter experts what are the learning objectives so that when they make edits and try to include additional content, you have something to reference back to on why that extra content doesn't support those learning objectives, right? So as we see here, this is our first slide here. And like I showed you earlier, this is a, a pretty stereotypical uh, written storyboard where we have a column or a section for audio narration, a section for on-screen text, a section for technical notes, and of course we have our slide number and title up here. So this is slide one, our course title screen. Here's our audio narration. Welcome to this introduction to accounting online course. Before we begin, blah, 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 blah. We have a lot to cover. So if you're ready to get started, click the begin button to continue. Uh, and then we see the on-screen text and graphics. So our on-screen text, we have our title, Introduction to Accounting. Uh, in terms of graphics, we have a series of icons with uh, indicating that it's a 10 minute course with a beginner level exam, an audio icon to indicate there's audio and closed captioning. All of that's mentioned there in that uh, audio narration. We have our client logo, and then we have our begin button. And if we look at our technical notes, the learner will click the begin button to start the course, right? So let's take a look at the fully de developed version of this slide so you can compare the storyboard to the actual uh, course itself. So I'm gonna jump here and let me replay this. 
Welcome to this introduction to accounting online course. Before we begin, note that this course will take you about 10 minutes to complete. And at the end, we'll test your knowledge with beginner level assessment. This course also contains audio narration and closed captioning. We have a lot to cover. So if you're ready to get started, click the begin button to continue. All right. So it has all of those same elements that we saw in the storyboard. It had the audio narration, we were able to hear that. It has our screen, our slide title here. We have those icons with the different uh, bits of text. We have our begin button. We have our logo. That storyboard described what we're seeing here on the screen, right? Now there's some elements like this image here didn't describe that, but that wasn't really critical at that stage in the development process. Again, we're having our stakeholder subject matter experts review our content. And in this instance, it made sense to just storyboard those important elements. We don't always have to include all of the details of the visuals. So let's move on to slide two here. Okay, here's another presentation slide, meaning that there isn't any interactivity. We're just presenting some audio narration and then there's some animated content that goes along with it. So slide two, our introduction, audio narration, all that here. So there's a lot that goes into the operations of a credit union, blah, 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 blah. And then we can see our graphics here. So we have a graph of a credit union animating in with various components. Once the graphic has animated in, the graphic shifts and makes room for on-screen text. And then we have some on-screen text. We have our learning objectives here, our bullet points. And the technical notes, the learner will click the next button to continue. Pretty simple. So let's take a look at it. There's a lot that goes into the operations of your credit union. Besides serving its members, in order for your credit union to successfully operate, it requires a team of accountants. They help to monitor financial performance and provide the information necessary for your credit union to make short and long-term financial decisions. In this course, you'll explore the role accountants play in your credit union, along with what they do and why they do it. You'll also explore how accounting information is used in the daily operations that make your credit union run smoothly. All right, so as we look at that example, all those elements were described in our storyboard. One thing I'll point out is, you know, a, a lot of times when we're describing our graphics, we don't have to be explicit uh, down to exactly what the graphic will look like or contain. So when I say a graphic of a credit union animating in, that's just what's in my mind's eye as I'm storyboarding this, right? Uh, what ends up happening actually on the slide might look very different, right? But all of these elements, you know, it was a, a graphic representing people who look like they're doing accounting work, right? It's not a, a literal representation of what I described in my storyboard, and my storyboard isn't a literal description of what I represented on the screen. And so it's just enough to give people the details of what they can expect in that completed learning experience. So let's look at slide three. This one's an interactive slide. So slide three, what, what accountants do? So we have our audio narration. Have you ever wondered, wondered exactly what an accountant does? Blah, 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 blah. These responsibilities can be organized into four steps. Click on each one to learn more. So in this slide, we have some presentation content and then it ends with a click to reveal. So we're gonna click on a series of buttons to reveal uh, and you can see how I outlined these four sections. So these are our four pop-up windows that have audio narration. That's why they're over here. And then if we look at our on-screen uh, graphics, and text. So we have animated graphics to accountant characters, transition to accountant working at a desk with various graphics showing the different types of work they do with the following on-screen text. They gather, organize, analyze, and present information. Then we're going to transition to a single accountant character with clickable icons for the four roles and responsibilities. And those four roles and responsibilities, when the learner clicks, is going to be a slide layer pop-up window. So pop-up window, uh, pop window is a graphic and summar it has a graphic and summarized text from the audio narration. And that is the same for all of these. And if we look at our technical notes, the learner will click on each of the four icons to reveal a pop-up window, providing a short explanation. Again, as you're reading through this, you can almost envision it in your mind's eye what that experience will be like. But let's take a look, all right? Have you ever wondered what exactly an accountant does, especially at a credit union? While you may have hired and worked with an accountant to help you process your yearly taxes, the role of an accountant within a credit union is a bit different. At its core, an accountant's job is to gather, organize, analyze, and present financial information, which helps your credit union make sound business decisions. These responsibilities can be organized into four steps. Click on each one to learn more. Okay, so we saw those animated bits going in and out as described in my storyboard. And now we have our four buttons here and I'll click on just one of these. The first duty of an accountant is to record all the business and financial transactions that occur within your credit union. This includes everything from members depositing or drawing funds from their checking accounts, processing payroll and salaries of credit union employees, the purchase of new computer equipment, and much more. 
To put it simply, any financial transaction, big or small, is recorded by an accountant. All right. So it's a good example of, uh, you know, a written storyboard with audio narration and how that translates into the completed course. Does it include explicit explanations of all the graphics and how it'll look and feel? No, but it gives enough detail that you can envision it in your mind's eye and that you can go ahead and start developing it, right? If you were to create this sort of storyboard and review it with your stakeholders and subject matter experts, there shouldn't be any surprises once you move into development, all right? Now I'm gonna show you another example. This one is from um, uh, another client of mine, and this one uh, is uh, on that diversity and equity and inclusion course I showed you earlier with the outline, right? And in this particular course, this was a written uh, or a visual storyboard that I created in PowerPoint, and I'll show you the fully developed course. And this was a text-based course because uh, their learners, the computers they use, wouldn't have audio, and the environment that they work in in a hospital is too loud to hear the audio. So we decided to present it all as a text-based course. And because it was text-based, I decided to go with a visual storyboard so that I could lay out how the text would be laid out on each screen or slide. So as we look at this visual storyboard here that I created in PowerPoint, I created it in PowerPoint because it's something I can send to my stakeholders, my subject matter experts, my clients, so they could review and comment and edit. You can see that it's really bare bones, right? It has our slide title. We have a subtitle here. We have a placeholder for a graphic, a positive and diverse workplace image or graphic. We have their logo. And then we have this button down here for begin, right? It, it shows the content and how it might be laid out with some information about the graphics, right? Even if it's just descripted, uh, described as a, a placeholder. We go into our first slide here. Here's our introduction, we have our slide title, we have the text, we have our placeholder, we have some information down here, click the next button to continue with our next button, pretty simple. Our next slide here, we have our main menu, right? Through the main menu, this course is divided three modules covering all three topics, blah, 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 blah. Uh, after you've completed each module you'll, be, module, you'll be able to advance to the course summary and conclusion. So each one of these represents an individual button that the learner would click on to proceed to that section. Then they would get to the course summary and conclusion. And these are just simple shapes and icons that I, I used in PowerPoint to lay this out. So it continues on. So we have another content slide, content slide. I mean, it's compliance training, so you know, um, it's a lot of content. Uh, and then we have some interaction slides, right? So here's a, uh, our first activity, is it discrimination? Uh, and if we go back to our outline, it's not all that different from what we had here, right? So we had the title slide, the introduction, the main menu. We're now here. Uh, we went through those slides. Now we're at this interact, uh, interaction here. It, is it discrimination? It's the activity, right? So in this example, I show, uh, it says select all the behaviors you think could be an example of discrimination under our policy, then click submit to continue. So we have our four options here. I indicate what the ones are uh, that are the correct options. And then we have our correct and incorrect feedback, right? Giving a really simple visual layout to how this course would actually flow. And the rest of the slides continue on just like that. I visualize different pop-up windows, how that'll work. So there's these different buttons and they click on a pop-up window, so forth and so on, right? So now let's go look at the developed version of this so you can compare it. So I'm gonna minimize this outline here and I'm gonna open up the completed version of the course. And so here is our title slide, do the right thing, maintaining a culture of diversity, inclusion and respect. We have our diverse positive workplace image. We have our slide title. We have our logo. We have our begin button. It's laid out differently, but it's all of the same elements that we had here in our visual storyboard, right? We'll go to our first slot content slide here, the introduction. So we have our text here and our placeholder image and the next button. Let's go look at the actual slide. Click begin here. All right, same elements. Here's our text content. Here is our image uh, that we used on this course and our previous next button and our text down there. All right, then I'm gonna continue on through some of these. Here's our main menu. All the same elements that we saw earlier. It's just stylized with actual graphics. So here's our main menu. Same exact elements, just with actual graphics and actual functionality, right? So let's take a look at what is diversity and inclusion. So we have some more text content, another stock image here. Here's our other presentation slide. And let's go to that first interaction slide there. Here we go. So is it discrimination, right? So all of those same elements that we saw on our visual storyboard here, 
just represented in the actual course. So select all the behaviors you think could be an example of discrimination under our policy, then click the submit button to continue. So not selecting someone for a job because of their religious attire, that's probably discrimination. Providing fair compensation based on experience, skills, and contribution, no. Not considering a pregnant woman for a promotion because she will go on maternity leave soon, now, it would be discrimination. Not telling an older employee about a job opportunity because, they, because you assume they will retire soon, definitely discrimination. Promoting a less qualified male employee over a more qualified female employee, for sure discrimination. All right, click submit. Hey, and there's our correct feedback. Same thing that we see here, right? So that's a really good example of how a visual storyboard relates to uh, the actual completed course. And like I said, it's really good when you're doing text-based courses, courses that don't include audio narration, because then you can really visualize how all of that content is gonna be laid out on the slide, all right? Now we'll come back to the storyboard when we talk about reviewing the storyboard. I'll show that later. I'm gonna show one more um, storyboard. This one was for a video project that I worked on for a client. We created a series of videos which included a, a actual live action talking head person with some uh, on-screen graphics and animations. It's kind of a mixture of an explainer video with some talking head video. And uh, this is a great example where it's kind of a hybrid between a written storyboard and a visual storyboard because when you're creating um, uh, video-based content, especially video-based content that includes like a talking head character or person, it kind of, you want to create something that's similar to the storyboard I showed you at the beginning where it looks like the movie scenes with all the different shots, right? This storyboard that we created is very similar to that. So I'm going to zoom in here. You can see here, this one is a little bit differently laid out. It's similar to our written storyboard. We have our audio script here, and then we have on-screen elements. And what I did here is for the audio script, I, I, I outlined all of that here, and it's broken up into these different sections. The reason why there's all this space in between these blocks of text uh, for the script is because we have these little um, graphics that I created. And I created these little uh, graphics to represent to visually represent how we're gonna move from one shot to the next. So here, usually represented like full screen text for like a title, then we had full screen talking head, then we had split screen with the person talking, maybe a split screen with some bullet points. You can see here we have the on-screen text for those bullet points. Then we have more full screen talking, and then I created this to represent when we're gonna have full screen animated graphics, and you can see that's described here, so various images as described in the audio, animated to highlight the mentioned homes. I'll show you what that means here in a moment. Same thing, then we're gonna transition back to talking head, back to graphics, so forth and so on, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at this video, and then uh, we'll pause and, and go back and forth between the script. So let's just look at this first paragraph of text in the video, which represents these first three scenes, if you will, right? I'll go back here, let's hit play. In the previous lesson, we went through the first three components for identifying your farm area, which include looking at the local economics, desirability, and competition. Again, the goal there was to identify which areas at the macro level you want to focus on and then begin narrowing in on the areas that best fit your investment strategy. And so in this lesson, we'll dive further into the key housing stats that will ensure you're focusing on the best opportunities within that area. This includes... Okay, I'm going to pause right there. So if we go back to our storyboard here, uh, all of what we just saw encompass, encompass this first paragraph and these first three scenes again, right? So we had the title, we had her talking full screen, then we had... Um, uh, a half screen with some bullet points and these bullet points, right? And then it continues on back and forth from there. Now I'm gonna jump to a part of the video where we do an animated part of the screen. In this example, we're looking at Redfin, which is a, uh, a real estate website. And again, this was on the topic of real estate investing, this particular project. And uh, we're talking about how do you look at different homes at different price points for the purpose of investing. And this one had a full screen animation. It says on screen animation, screen showing redfin.com, highlighting areas of the town and showing various homes for sale, highlight groups of homes as mentioned. And you can see here in the audio, it says, we can say that 80% of the homes shown 
uh, are 1,000 square feet to 2,750 square feet, 90% have two bedrooms, four bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So in this example, it's actually animating what we're talking about there. So let me jump to that part here in the video. Give me one moment here, okay. Particular kitchen feature like a kitchen island. For example, if we return to Redfin here, let's say we've decided to focus on this area of town. If we look at the homes that sold within the last year, we can see that over 80% had between 1,000 square feet and 2,750 square feet. Over 90% had two to four bedrooms and over 80% had over two bathrooms. And yes, while there were smaller and larger homes sold, we want to focus on the most commonly sold properties, not the exception. While Redfin is a good... Re All right, so I'll pause it there. So again, you can see how this storyboard is describing what we're gonna see here on the actual screen. It's showing the different shots. It may not be explicit, but it's giving enough description so that when it came time to edit it, I could actually edit this to make that come to life on the screen, all right? So those are different storyboard examples. We'll reference back to these as we talk a little bit more about some of the different tips for storyboarding. All right, so we talked about organizing your content. Step number two, we talked about picking a format and a little bit about uh, examples for that. And step number three, we're gonna talk about drafting a storyboard. This is where you actually start writing the content of the storyboard, and this is where you probably run into a lot of roadblocks. Now, we already just looked at a bunch of different examples of storyboards. Um, you know, like I said a moment ago, this is where you're gonna run into roadblocks, where you sit your screen and you go, oh my gosh, I have to write every single word of whatever it is you're creating a course on. And my best tip is just start typing. Just start typing. It's gonna be really messy at first, but as you continue editing it and going back and restructuring it and you follow along with your outline, it will slowly start coming uh, together. And one of the things that you wanna do is include the right details in your storyboard. Uh, and you saw a lot of these in my examples. I'll show them again uh, here in a moment. You always wanna include your slide numbers and titles. You wanna show, typically, I like to show the learning objectives. Again, it's that North Star. Uh, you wanna include the text and audio content, usually a description of the graphics, a description of interactivity and uh, functionality, all right? Um, and what you're striving for when you write your storyboard is you're striving for what I call a development-ready storyboard, all right? And whenever I'm reviewing storyboards for other people, I usually look at them not just from an instructional design standpoint, but I'm looking at them from a technical standpoint, the technical quality of the storyboard. And what I always tell people is that if I can read through your storyboard and I can imagine in my mind's eye or envision in my mind's eye what that course experience is gonna look like and feel like and how it's gonna flow, then you have enough detail in it. Because here's the, the reality, some instructional design teams, they're structured in such a way where you have people who are writing storyboards and then they hand it off to somebody else to develop it. Just like an architect hands off a blueprint to somebody to build a house. You have to include enough information for whoever's developing it, even if it's just you, enough information to actually develop that course, right? That's what it means to create a development-ready storyboard. Theoretically, you can hand it off to somebody and who had no involvement in that storyboard and they can develop it. And even if you're just doing it for yourself, if even if you're the writer, the storyboarder, and the developer, you still wanna strive for a development-ready storyboard because here's the thing, all that effort you put into writing a storyboard, which some people will tell you is a waste of time, which I totally disagree with, all that effort is gonna make development that much easier because now you're just worrying about making it come to life on the screen and making it look good and function properly, right? So let's take an example of what I mean by development-ready storyboards, right? So let's uh, open up some of these storyboards here. Um, like I said, with development-ready storyboards, it indicates, you know, if I have a pop-up window, it's gonna indicate that, that it's a pop-up window and it's going to include what information is going to be presented in that pop-up window. It doesn't just say learner clicks a button to reveal additional information about recording transactions. Well, what information is actually going to reveal? You need to include that. Or if, for example, let's go down here. Uh, here are some uh, series of questions, right? So here's the questions. Uh, it's a series of scenarios where they have to identify, is Andrea an accountant? There's yes and no's. Those are the, the options that they're presented with. There's correct and incorrect feedback that's presented. All of that is uh, what you want to include in a development-ready storyboard, right? 
Same thing is true with our visual storyboard here. Like a, a, this is a great example on this screen here. I'm indicating what's correct, what's incorrect. I'm providing what's gonna actually be presented with the feedback. I have a clear sense of what the flow is. All of that really makes sense. You wanna have enough details that you could theoretically hand this off to somebody and they could develop it. It might look different visually, right? Uh, but it does include all of the correct elements. That's what you want in a development ready storyboard, all right? Okay, so we talked about organizing your content, picking a format, talked about drafting the first draft of your storyboard. The, the best thing you can do is just start typing, strive towards that development ready storyboard. Now we're gonna talk about steps four and five together. We're gonna talk about reviewing the storyboard and editing the storyboard because these things happen multiple times throughout your project. And what you wanna really be focused on is managing your review cycles. Part of the reason you're creating a storyboard is not just to help you plan on what you're gonna build before you build it, but because you need to get buy-in approval from those that you're working with, your stakeholders, your subject matter experts, your clients, uh, they need to review it and provide commentary, and you need to involve them in the review of it throughout the, the process. But you want to carefully manage it so that you don't ex experience scope creep. So some tips about review cycles. First, you always want to determine early on who needs to review the storyboard. Who is the person who needs to review it and approve it? Get them involved early, uh, as, as early as possible in the actual uh, project. What you don't want is you don't want to go back and forth with somebody uh, developing and finalizing a storyboard and then find out at the 11th hour and go, oh, hey, I need to make sure my VP reviews it. Well, now you're involving a brand new person in the review process and they could really throw a wrench in things. That person probably should have been involved, been involved from the get-go. So determine who needs to be involved in the review of your storyboard. Second, control the number of review cycles. So you want to set out a goal for how many review cycles you're going to have because otherwise you'll find that you can easily spiral into an unlimited number of review cycles and you never actually get the project or the storyboard done, right? I strive for two review cycles. I do my first draft of the storyboard, There's then they review it. That's one review cycle. Then I take their edits and I implement their edits second review cycle. By the time I finish that second review cycle, we should be like 95% there. If not, it might require a third review cycle, but if we're going beyond three review cycles, we're getting to four or five review cycles, then there's something wrong, right? So you wanna control how many review cycles you're having because uh, you don't wanna delay actually getting to development. But at the same time, you wanna make sure that uh, you and your stakeholders and subject matter experts and reviewers, or your client, you wanna make sure they're good with that storyboard before you move to development. So it might take more review cycles, try to control the scope of how many review cycles you're doing, but don't move forward till the development until they tell you, yep, I think it's good, all right? The other thing you wanna do is provide uh, instructions for reviewing the storyboard. Don't send a storyboard off to your stakeholder and subject matter expert and expect them to just understand what to do with it. Provide them instructions, and I'll show you an example of that here in a moment. And then carefully manage scope creep. Inevitably, when you're reviewing a storyboard, they're gonna to want to include additional content. They're gonna to wanna to add additional scenarios or remove content uh, or change it all together. And you wanna be careful to manage that scope creep. You know, If they wanna add a whole section, refer back to those learning objectives. Does it align with those? Does it align with the learning goals? Does it make sense for it to be part of that course? Or maybe it's a separate course or separate project, okay? Um, and you wanna go back and forth with this, draft and review, draft and review, draft and review, until you uh, get to the development ready version of your storyboard that you can start um, developing. Now, I wanna talk about those instructions I mentioned a moment ago. Whenever I send a storyboard off to review, I usually include some instructions either in the email or in the storyboard itself. So here's an example of this visual storyboard. I provided these instructions before they even got to the first slide. I said, you know, this is a visual e-learning storyboard for the diversity inclusion course. Many of the slides throughout the storyboard include placeholder images, buttons, and text. The storyboard is not in italics, not meant to represent the final look and feel of the course. It's simply to outline the slide content, slide by slide, and give a rough idea of the layout of each slide. As you review the storyboard, focus solely on the content accuracy and structure, and please do not make edits directly in the content. Instead, add comments with your specific edits so that I can track those changes, right? You wanna provide guidance on what you're sending them, what it is that they're looking at, 
what type of feedback you're looking for and how they should provide that feedback. Don't assume otherwise, because if you have, are working with a client or stakeholders or subject matter experts who've never been involved in the creation of an e-learning course before and you send a storyboard like this, they're gonna go, what is this? This doesn't look like an e-learning course. And they're really gonna say that when you send over a Word document like this, they're gonna be, this does not look like an e-learning course. What am I looking at, right? So tell them, it's like a script. It's outlining the content. We need to validate the content before we start development, right? You have to carry them in through the process. And then tell them, what do you want them focusing on? I don't want them focusing on why this is blue, right? Because it's not gonna be blue in the final course, but they're going to think that they need to focus in on it unless you tell them, hey, I just want you to focus on content and structure. Don't worry about the visuals. And how do you want them to make edits? Track those changes add comments. Don't just edit my storyboard. Give me the edits and I'll implement those edits, right? You want to provide those instructions and that'll make your review cycles uh, a little less <laughs> hectic and headache inducing, if you will. All right. And you go back and forth on that until you finish the design development of your course. All right. So how do you write an e-learning storyboard? Like I said, start by collecting your content. You might have to curate it or create it. Then you want to create an outline. Next, you want to pick a storyboard format, visual storyboard, written storyboard, all right? There's those two different types of storyboards. Or create your own template, whatever works for you. Then you're actually going to draft that storyboard. You're going to work towards that development-ready storyboard that has all those details. And then you're going to review the storyboard and edit the storyboard. You're going to go in those, those cycles until you finish that. Once you've done all that, then you're ready to move on into prototyping, creating a prototype, and moving on into the development of your actual course. So that's my process for writing storyboards. And I encourage you, like I said at the top of today's how-to workshop, take my process and adapt it for your own projects. Uh, for what works best for you. You don't have to follow my process or anyone's process because everyone does it a little bit differently. And of course, if you want to learn more about my storyboarding process, check out my book, The E-Learning Designer's Handbook. Just search e-learning on Amazon. It'll come out, uh, it'll come up and I'll put a link down in the description. As always, I want to thank you so much for watching today's how-to workshop on how to write an e-learning storyboard. As I mentioned at the top of today's session, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and that bell button to get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And again, make sure to join us inside the e-learning designers community where you can connect and network with others who are looking to grow their e-learning design careers and their skills. All right, I want to thank you so much for watching this how-to workshop. I hope I made the process of storyboarding a little or hopefully a lot easier for you. All of the templates and resources I explained in today's session, I'll include a link down in the description where you can check all of that out on the e-learning designers academy website. Otherwise, my name is Tim Slade and until next time, I'll see you around.